All right, we're recording. <clears throat> All right, well, how is everybody? Let me hear from everybody before we start. I'm good here. I'm doing good since I got my tooth taken out. Oh, was it a wisdom tooth or what? Uh, it was just uh, the second molar on the top right, and it uh, it got infected, so they had to pull it out. Oh, well, I know you are a lot better. Yeah, my face ain't as red, puffy, and burning anymore. So. Oh, that's so good. Yeah. We got to get nope. it done. Yes. What? No, two days ago now. Mon Monday. Praise the Lord. What about you, Lulu? Doing great. Maybe sitting right now with the uh -huh. two grandchildren. Good. I see so, some of the things that you post, and I always love what you say. Yes, thank I, you. I see that every now and then. I know, really, you're a great little faith person. I know thank that. Thank you. And uh, I know Debbie B is doing well. I'm trying really hard. That's okay. what I'm doing. I'm just pl plowing forward every day. Okay. Day by day, right? Yes, in faith. And Spencer and Stacy, is Stacy there this time? I'm here. Oh, I'm hi, Stacy. I'm always here. I'm just real quiet. <laughs> okay. But you're the prayer warrior, which we love. Well, thank you. Yeah, I might. Um, I just, it's okay. Uh, would you start us out with prayer? You bet. Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, as we gather here tonight, dear Jesus, we just lift our hearts up to praise to you, dear Lord. Uh, I just think that it's wonderful when two or more get together, dear Lord, to to praise you and to speak your word, dear Lord. Mm -hmm. May you give Sylvia the words that she needs to speak mm -hmm. to our hearts, Jesus. And that may we all walk away with something special from this evening's services, dear Lord. I just ask that you guide us all, dear Jesus, and let us get what we need. Times are trying, dear Lord. People's patience are worn thin. I just ask that you give us the guidance that we need, dear Jesus. Mm -hmm. Say that all we have asked and we shall receive. So, dear Lord, I'm asking on behalf of all of us that you guide us and give us the wisdom and strength that we need to carry through. In your most precious heavenly name, I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much, Stacy. It's precious, precious, precious. Uh, it reminds me of yesterday, you know, um, Lewis was saying he had a tooth pulled. Well, yesterday I had my teeth cleaned. I have have that done every like six months, I guess. And I was with my hygienist and no, I didn't want fluoride. No, I didn't want any more x-rays and blah, blah, blah. So she wanted to ask about me and also finally, you know, what church do I go to? And actually I said, well, actually I have a home church. My home is my church and people come here to worship the Lord and also, you know, for prayer and counseling and all. And so she said, well, I really, she, and I said, and basically I want people to understand that Christ is in them. We always think Christ is like helping us from the outside or walking beside us. But the whole truth of the, of the meaning of Christianity is that Christ is the indwelling person within. And she immediately said, well, I certainly don't know that but I'd like to, just like that. She was so sweet and honest. And she said, I'm just praying, but I don't know that. And so I said, well, you're welcome to come to our Bible study. And she wanted to know about it. And she said, now, what do you do when you go to Cuba? Do you preach the word? I said, yes, yes, I preach the Bible, the word, right. And so, and I said, but, so at the end, I, and she said, well, I really might want to come to your Bible study. I said, I, I really believe it will help you. And I said, but can I pray for you now? Yes. So right there in the office, I always like to grab people's hands. And I prayed for her. And I said, oh, precious heavenly father, this precious woman desires to really know you. You know, and she doesn't know you as the indwelling spirit within her. 
and and I know that you want her to know you that way and she wants to know you that way and I said so oh Lord I'm just praying that you would reveal yourself in her and cause her to know that you are the indwelling life that she can know you personally as your Lord and Savior and the indwelling spirit within that indwells her and that you she can hear from you so I prayed for you and she said Amen. And I said, now, Bridget, I said, now, just know that God will reveal himself to you. How do I know? Well, he would have never sent me here to you and you to me. I mean, she she was not my first hygienist. She was like the third, I think. And I said, I wouldn't be coming here, be telling you this if God was not going to reveal himself to you, to you personally. And I said, so just, just know, just watch the next time that I talk with you, that you will say, you will say, oh, the Lord talked with me. He told me this. He told me that. I said, so you just watch and wait for him to do that. Well, now, of course, that's what I pray and believe for everyone, that they will know the indwelling Christ within, because the way we think of Christ is always you know, we know, you know, he's that God, the father's in heaven. We think we think, well, somewhere maybe I have the Holy Spirit. Usually people don't really realize the fullness of that. And then they think of Christ. Now he's going to he's like the footsteps in the sand, like he'll rescue me when I can't anymore. When I come, when I can't do it, then he'll do it. What we don't understand is he is the eternal life within us. He is eternal life. The Bible says, he that hath the son has life eternal. So the only way that we can have eternal life is uh, in the future is to have it now because Christ is eternal life. He is the life within us. And it is a divine life too. It's not my life redone or made better. It's his own divine life within us by the Holy Spirit. And so really, that's what Colossians is going to be telling us. That's where we are. We've, we've been studying. We've been talking about Colossians. And I want to basically take us to the next part of Colossians. Because Colossians is going to tell us what the fullness of the gospel is. And not only that, what the mystery of the gospel is, which is Christ in you, the only hope. Of glory. The only way that we can go to heaven really is to have Christ in us before we even go to heaven. Well, how do we have Christ in us? You accept him as Lord and Savior, but most people don't realize when we do accept him, he's not some outer Christ that walks around beside us and helps us outwardly. He really is within us. And he is, God is in spirit. He's not now, he manifests himself through our flesh, but he's not flesh. You know, we're the human, and he's the God that lives in the human. The human never becomes God, and God, and God never really becomes human. But he can manifest and live through humanity when we accept him as Lord and Savior. And then he expresses his self through us to actually to be the very source of our life. So our life source is not in our own flesh. The source of our life is not in my intellectual understanding or even what I've been educated to know. I mean, there's lots of people can know a lot about the Bible and they do not know the indwelling Christ. And therefore they're not gonna be able to read the scriptures and really understand what they mean because the Bible tells us no man in his own intellectual understanding can know the things of God. You cannot know the things of God that way. Why? Because we have to know them because these are, these are heavenly truths. They are, these are eternal truths. And so they're not of this world. Now, God can manifest his love, his life, himself through us who are in this world. But only as we give our hearts and our minds to him. And we do that when we accept him. 
and know him. And then he manifests himself, makes himself known to us. That's God's job. It's not my job to try to get to know God. It's God's job to make himself known in us because we can never get to God by trying to know him. We never can get there that way. But we pray, Lord, reveal yourself to me. That's really the, the right prayer. Reveal yourself, reveal your presence. Because when we realize that he promises to come inside of us and his very divine presence comes within us, then we can truly know him. You, we cannot know him. Knowing about him does not, you can't know him that way. You're not knowing him. Knowing him means I'm one with him. He's in me and I'm in him. That's really knowing him. And so in, in knowing him, then we understand the things of the scripture. And so I could have never, if I'd read the Bible all my life, I could have never known what I know today. Because what I've learned, it's, it's about because the Holy Spirit has revealed these truths to me. But I'm not the only one. I mean, God wants to reveal them to all of us. He wants all of us to understand his ways, his, his scriptures, what, what he means. He doesn't want to keep any of it secret to any of us. But there are a lot of hidden things that, are, that God conceals to us. And why? Because we're re really not really ready to receive it. He can he reveals himself to us when we're ready to receive it. And basically, usually that's when we've come to the end of our own self. We've come to the end of trying to make it all work, either our life or, you know, parts of our life. Or we've pretty much kind of come to the end of figuring it out or knowing what in the world does all this mean finally when you come to that place then he starts revealing himself and i could tell that that hygienist had come to that part she says i've knelt down i just want to know him i just want to know him well he wants to reveal himself to her and i needed to pray that prayer to her and i'll pray that prayer to anybody here that really wants me to pray that prayer for you because god wants to reveal himself in each one of you and i believe he already is i believe that's why you're still here you're still here there's something inside of all of you all that know what you're hearing is is true you don't know how you know but you know it is and that's why you keep coming back that's what i believe that's why what kept me back coming back somehow i knew this was right and how do we know that well in the first part of the Gospel of John, the, uh, the, God says this, there is a light that lights every man and woman that comes into the world, everyone, every lost person, every person, there is a light. Now, what? Now it's not saving light. It's not what's going to save everybody because they have this little bit of light. This light is there to witness to us when we hear the truth we will know it you won't know why you know it and how you know it but you will know it and it will draw you it draws you to to more no more light so every one of us has that light in us and we're drawn really to know more to know more no more. I've got to know more. I've got to understand this. And you see, the only reason that I teach is to only share with you <coughs> what you already have in Christ if you've received him. If you've received him, you already have his fullness. Most people don't understand this, and most people have never heard this before. And actually, my son-in-law says it in a great way. He said, years ago, he said to the Lord, I'm not walking in the truth, but I certainly am not hearing it anywhere either. Can you give me somebody that will get, uh, share with me what the real truth is? Now, this is where the light comes in. When a person that is really hungry to know, when they hear 
the truth, they will know deep in their spirit that it is truth. They don't know how, they can't explain it, and they maybe can't even talk about what did she say or he say. I don't know, but I just know it's the truth. Now, I knew that I was that way. I was that way years ago, way in the, gosh, in the early 60s, because I was married in 1960. And from the, from the, all the way through that 10 years, I was searching for truth because I had already been married twice and it wasn't working. It wasn't, I wasn't, so I had to find out how in the world does this life work? How, 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 how is there harmony? How, how, the Bible tells me that I'm supposed to have peace that passes all understanding. The Bible tells me that I'm, that I have joy unspeakable, full of glory. I didn't have any of those things. Nothing like that manifested in me. And I wasn't satisfied if the Bible says that that's mine to have and I wasn't experiencing it, I had to find out why. How come? Was there something wrong with me? Well, no, it's just that I was blinded to the truth, really. So when I first did hear the truth, I was so drawn to it like a moth is to light. That's why I know that that what the Bible says, there's this light in every person. Now, what you can do with this light, when you hear the truth or you're presented with the truth, you can either say, yes, yes, I know this is true. And I want to learn more. I want, I want more. Or and a lot of people do this. A lot of people say, yeah, yeah, I know that's the truth, but it's not for me. Maybe maybe when I'm older or maybe it's okay for women and children, but not for me. You know, I'm handling everything. Okay. Well, the Lord labors with us. His, he is long suffering with all of us. And so he'll wait until we get to the place where we can really want the truth and when we want the truth we're finished with the lies the lies have deceived us we've all lived the liar's life half of our life you know uh, you know we're hearing all the time that everything's been a lie well the problem is all of us have been lied to by the devil not even by other people as much as by the devil the devil then in people still lie to us too all right the problem is we've believed it and we've been satisfied with those lies well the truth really wakes us up and when you hear spiritual truth it's either going to make you hungry you'll want more or you push it down and say no no not for me now maybe when i'm older ready to die or something i might or or i don't want to hear it at all but so you're going to, so every one of us are really responsible because every, uh, every one of us know when they hear the truth, you can either refuse it or not. And how that's why the Bible says no man at any time is without excuse. None of us can have an excuse. Well, you know, I didn't hear about Jesus. Doesn't matter. You've got the light in you. You can look at the creation. If you want to know about God, he's, he's here to tell you in a million ways. If you don't want to know about God, then the devil's got a lot of deceptions for you to believe. And he'll draw you away in a million, a million times. So I just wanted to start out that way to tell us that we're all here together because each one of us really not only want to know God, we, we want God to know us. We want to know God's ways. We want to know, I want to know. I mean, how does all this work? How do I work? How can I walk in you? How can I know you? How can I, how can that be true? See, God wants people hungry. When they're hungry for the truth and you hear it, you just gobble it up. You can't wait to hear more. And I think each one of you all that are here are just like that. You can't wait to hear more. I believe that or you wouldn't keep coming back. So now I'm going to start right in Colossians. But I was talking to Dave before we went on. And I said, Dave, 
in our age where everything has been a lie and everything is fake, Jesus tells us at the end, there's going to be great, great, great deceptions, greater than ever before. So deceptive that it's going to, it would even deceive the very elect. It would even deceive spirit-filled people that are walking in Christ. It would, it would be so deceptive. And I said, I, I want to spend some time talking about some of those deceptions that's coming. And what, how is it coming? And how is Satan here to deceive us? Because when people start out hearing the truth and be drawn to the truth, Satan hates it. And he will want people to be pulled back under lies. So I thought sometime during our time together, we're really going to discuss that exactly. Some of the deep deceptive lies that Satan's going to come up with. Because I, I really think I've got a, some kind of a handle on it. Only by the spirit, not by my own thinking. But by my own, by the wisdom of God and by my own experience. You know, some of the great deceptions that are going to come. I am going to talk about that at some point. And I think we should because they're, they are gradually creeping our way. Okay, let me just give you a hint. When, when God told Adam not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he was talking about, he was, what is that? Well, we know a tree is not a knowledge. That's the way we think. You see, it's the way we understand. What was that knowledge? It was really Satan's own knowledge, his divided knowledge of good and evil. What do I mean by that? There is an evil side that is obvious evil in that tree, a knowledge of obvious evil. I think we've seen plenty of that lately, and to the depths of it just absolutely would freak anybody out. I don't think any of us really understood that until that's, but that's being revealed what obvious evil is. But let me tell you, the other side is good evil. What do you mean good evil? It looks good. It sounds good. It seems right, but it's evil. And it's really more deceptive than evil evil the evil side of the knowledge of the satanic knowledge. It is, it's really new age oneness. That's one way. And that's been coming for a long time. That's nothing new. That's been coming. That's really, that's not really new. That's old age deception, Satan's deception. And the, and that good is to make you think, actually, it makes you think that the human is God that the human itself is God and doesn't need God because we are sufficient in ourselves. You see, well, and, and a lot of times it's manifested as religious good, very deceptive because there's part truth in it, and but it's still evil. Why? Because the source of it is not in God's spirit. It is not from the tree of life. It's not from Christ. It's man thinking and being deceived in his own mind that he can really be his own God. Now, even lost people, we would never say that. A lost person would never say that. We all have acted that way. You know, I'm just, I'm just me. I've got my own will. I've got my own right. I've got my own wrong. I'll just be me and I'm just me alone. Well, that's a very deceived person because there's no such thing as you alone. None of us. We've always been indwelt by one spirit or the other, by either the devil's spirit. Well, what is that? Well, it can be very nice. It can be religious. It can do good things. It can give money. It can help other people. It can sit on the front row of the church and boast of, its, of all that it's done good. And it's a devil in disguise. That's good evil. 
That's what the Pharisees were with Jesus. He called them the devil. Well, they looked like they were priests. They were good. They looked right. And they were not. They were devils. So it can be religious. And actually, we will all, before the end, you know, the Bible prophesies that we will come to one world religion. Well, I think the root of that is in what I call universalism. There is a belief, and I know people that even believe this, that everybody's going to be saved. Whether you really, it doesn't matter what you've done in this lifetime, what you've believed or not believed, or with whether you've taken Christ or not. We already all have Christ, and we're already all going to heaven. Well, that is anti-Christ and anti-the Bible, I can tell you that. And anti-cross, there would be no need for, cross, for the cross of Christ. But they will say, no, Jesus died for everybody, so therefore everybody's already saved. I've heard all this. I've been with people that say this. After a while, they kind of go crazy, and a lot of bad things starts happening to them. Why? Because it's the devil. It is good evil. You see, it's still evil. But it looks good. It sounds good. It, it it makes you it puffs you up to be good. You see, it's still it's it's still a satanic person. And and so and they believe some people even believe the devil's going to be reconciled. He'll be in heaven, too. And I, I heard somebody that says this is the craziest thing I've ever heard of. It would be like Hitler. The angels coming to get Hitler and say, Hitler, come on, you get to go to heaven. And he'll say, but I don't want to go to heaven. I don't want to go to heaven. It doesn't matter. You have to go anyway. I mean, when, when that person told me that, I just laughed. But that's how ridiculous it is to believe that. And that's really what, what people are coming to. Every religion, you know, then everybody's right. Every religion has some right. And we're all going to end up. Well, then that made God, that made Jesus Christ a liar. That made him a lunatic or a liar and, or, and not who he says he was. Because Jesus said, there's only one way and I am the way. I am the truth and I am the light, life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Okay, Jesus you're either telling us the truth or you're a damn liar. And that's what people are saying. Well, he didn't really mean it that way. No, you can't put him in that category. Either he's telling the truth or he's a liar. You can't say he's somewhere in between. And so, and so we Christians, we really have to contend for the faith because there's a lot of new age garbage that's going going around a lot and and i'm not going to go into a whole lot of it right now because i want to get into the scripture but i just wanted to say that and i also wanted to tell you in matthew 24 jesus is talking about two things i think i said this a minute ago he's talking about the destruction of 70 a.d when the temple was destroyed but he's also, because he was asked two questions by his disciples. When will this thing, when this be? Well, they were looking at the temple and they were saying it was so beautiful. And Jesus says, no, in three days it will come down. But after three days, I will, it will rise again. And they thought, what? They, they thought he was talking about, what are you talking about? Well, he was talking about himself. He is the temple of God just like we are the temple of the living God. And he was talking about himself. He would die, and then after three days, he would come back. But anyway, he was also prophesying that that temple that they were looking at would actually be destroyed. Why? Because it's the end of the old covenant, and the new covenant had begun. And the old had to be done away with because people still wanted to mix the old with the new. There's no mixture. You cannot mix the old with the new. The old is obsolete. And the new covenant is all new promises of grace and mercy 
and truth. The old covenant was filled, filled with rigid laws and requirements and what we had to do and could, could do and could not do. The new covenant is filled with promises that the Holy Spirit will come in us and guide us into all truth and make sure that we walk in the truth as we trust him. So we're not under rig rigorous laws of thou shalt what, okay, we should, okay, there's certain things we should eat. There's certain things we should not eat. There's some, certain days we should worship, other days we should not. We're not under any of those. And I can read you a verse right in Colossians. I want to do that right now. Because if you if you got your Bible, and if you turn to, um, to uh, chapter 2, we're still just on one, and I'm going to go back to there. But look at chapter 2, verse 16. I love this. It says, let no man, therefore, judge you in meat, that means what you eat or don't eat, or drink, what you drink or don't drink, or respect of holy days, which day is your that you say is your Sabbath, or because Sabbath in the New Testament is Sabbath rest is resting continually inside. It's not about a day. It's not about a certain day. And that's why he said, don't let anybody judge you about these things or about the new moon or the Sabbath day, see? Well, people divide religions all the time. Well, we're, we're, we worship on Saturday because that's the Jewish Sabbath and not Sunday. Well, no, we worship on Sunday because that's the first day of the week and that, you know, and so, but, so we're like, this. I'm telling you, there's more divisions in the body of Christ than in the world, almost. I mean, they're always dividing over all these kind of things, which day we should worship, and what we, uh, what we eat and what we don't eat, and whether we have a glass of wine or we don't have a glass of wine, all these things, it says, do not let anybody judge you for that reason. And he says, which is a shadow of things to come. But the point is, we are the body of Christ. The body of Christ is not under these Old Testament laws. Not under any of that. And so many, even Christians, go back, start trying to do all the Old Testament. They're going backwards. There's, there's lots said about that in the, in the Bible as well. So but let's now where we left off last time, and I know I've spent just a half an hour just doing the introduction here. Okay, I'm in chapter one of Colossians, starting with verse 15. I told you that verse 9 through 14 really is pretty much a prayer that Paul is praying for these Colossians, and uh, and it's it's for us as well i mean it's a wonderful prayer because it tells us like even in verse 13 well let's start with 11 giving thanks unto the father which has made us meet that means worthy to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light see being in light means that not only you have that everyone has a little light but you but you have now the light of the world which is christ in you who is the light you see so it calls us the saints in light in other words we're walking in the truth the truth is light the lies is darkness and death the truth is light and 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 truth you see and so and saints well, who is a saint? It's not somebody that the Pope has decided is a saint if they've done such and such and they've done all the requirements. That's all, I hate to say it this way, but it's all BS, okay? It's not true. None of it is true. Because when we are saved and saved by the blood of Christ and we trust in him to save us, he calls us his saints. Now, are we always acting saintly? Probably not. But you see, in time, we're learning now 
to walk as Jesus walked, to be as he was in this world, which is really a humble servant to, of God. And that's really what we are. Well, we might not fully be walking in the light, but we already are children of light because we have taken the light. Jesus is the light of the world. You see, he is that light. He is that truth. And it is the only truth that really, truly sets us free. And then it says, who has delivered us? And it's talking about the father has delivered us from the power of darkness. That's what we all walked in when we walked in the lies of this world and the lies that we thought about ourselves or this world or God or Jesus, you know, the light has come so we can truly see and we're not walking in, in this darkness where we don't see and we're blind and have, and he's not only given a, a taken us out of the power of darkness. In other words, it doesn't mean that we might have some dark days occasionally, but you see, he's delivered us from the power of it. In other words, it can't really have truly have power over us that God will bring us answers. God will gain us victory. Even in the dark days in the hard times, God is omnipresent. He's, he didn't go anywhere. He's not gone anywhere. And he's always there to lift us up and give us victory in anything that happens to us. It says that we that we always move from victory to victory. Well, where is victory? Does it mean our outer circumstances change? Most of the time, no. A lot, maybe some of the times it does. Okay, that's great. But victory first starts inside of us. And somehow, whatever we're going through, God lifts us. And, and, and it makes it okay. And somehow we're making it. And we think we don't know how, but we are. And it's not like it used to be where it used to just kill me and keep me defeated. He's lifted me of it somehow on the inside. Now that's his life being manifested in us. And translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Now we're in a whole nother kingdom. I was saying that last time. We, we understand what's going on in the kingdom of this world. It is pretty sad, pretty bad, really, really, really worse than we ever realized. However, that's, that's the evil side of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Wait until the good side comes and see what we do with it. Because all, all the fake everything that we've heard forever, starting with Trump, fake news, and then on on and on and on. The devil will use that to tell us that even our faith is fake and what we've believed about Jesus is fake and our Bible is lying to us. The devil will absolutely use that to tell us all that what we have, well, you are just old school. You're, you're not in the quantum level now. You're, 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 you know, you're still behind the times. Now, you know, don't you know, even Jesus is fake. I mean, they'll say that. It will be, and a lot of Christians, if they're not grounded and rooted in Christ, they will be deceived. They will be. So, and then it says, in whom we have redemption. That means to be bought back from the devil through his precious blood, through his death on the cross, even the forgiveness of sins. And it's, that's already ours. Now he's moving into, after he settled that, and this is Paul in jail, in prison, in Rome, writing this letter to the Colossi. This is a city, I think in Turkey, I think. I think so. And um, I think I'd have to look at that again. So, but anyway, I do know that he was in Rome in jail. But his prison, you know, he was taken to Rome because he was a Roman citizen. And when he was, he, he finally went to Jerusalem and got in a lot of trouble there. And then when the jailer found out that he was really a Roman, they said, well, then let Rome judge you. So he had to, he, had, he made this journey to Rome, which was awful. It was shipwrecked and a lot of bad things happened to him. Finally he gets to Rome and they can't figure out what the problem, Rome can't even figure out what the problem is with this man. 
the Jews just want to kill him, you know, just like they did Jesus. And, but they can't even find anything wrong with him. Everywhere he goes, when he says his piece before the judges, even the some of the early, earlier judges, then it's almost like Pilate says, I just want to wash my hands from this. I can't find anything wrong with Jesus, you see, even though he went ahead and, you know, had Jesus, gave Jesus to the Jews, knowing that they were, they would crucify him, which they did. And he was still guilty, but not as guilty as the Jews, that's for sure. And so, and so every, Paul, it was the same way. Every time Paul would give his, his part, it would be so powerful and be in the spirit that the, the people that were judging him, they could never find anything wrong with him. But there he was in Rome waiting for the final verdict, which was he was going to be beheaded. He knew that. But by this time, they had given him great favor. And he wasn't really locked up. He had like house arrest. So he was able to do letters. And, and he wrote a lot of these letters. He never gave up on his churches. These are all the churches that he began while he did his journeys. And he journeyed three times all the way through the Mediterranean, you know, uh, uh, the northern part of Mediterranean, not, you know, the, uh, I guess it would be the African, like not so much. In, he, he didn't go to Egypt or any of those or Libya or any of those African places. He always went to Greece and, um, um, you know, to all those cities that were northern, northern part of the Mediterranean Sea. And so, and he went, he made three journeys into those areas, into all those cities, the whole time bringing and walking a lot of the times. I don't know that he rode horses. I don't know if he even had a horse. He walked a lot. And I think got rides and walk, not by himself. I'm sure he, there were people with him, at least had one or two with him at all times, you know, going to these places and preaching the gospel and having these people that were e heathen. They, they knew nothing of God. And actually, it says in the book of Ephesians that the Gentile nations, that's all of us, unless you really are Jewish, true Jewish descent which I don't think there are many today. But anyway, uh, the Bible says that, that we were without a covenant from God and therefore without God, we had no hope. We were, and I can read you the verse that actually says it. All the Gentiles throughout all the world had no hope. Why? Because they had no promise from God, which is a covenant. Nothing that God had promised them that they had to believe to make them right with God. We didn't have that. The Jews had that first. Well, we know they refused him and actually ended up crucifying him. So, and then they were scattered all over the world. So, but now Paul is, was a Jew, but his, his ministry was for all the Gentile world. Well, the Gentile world, they were full of, um, everybody had gods that they worshipped. And these were all the fake, false principalities of powers that were ruling in these areas, you see. And uh, so he had to go and give the gospel to these kind of people that would always go to the temple where they had all, all kinds of sex rites in these temples. They would drink blood, offered to sacrifices. They would also sacrifice children. That is not anything new. That's happened forever because it's Satan requires that. And so, you know, they were far from God. And then he would go to these places and he would preach the gospel. And the power of his preaching would absolutely transform the people. And they would be saved and filled with the spirit. Well, this was really new because the Jews hardly realized that anybody else but them would know God. Well, even Peter had to get used to it because God saw he, he started seeing that the Gentiles were all 
being saved and filled with the spirit. So, and the Jews were pretty uh, prejudiced against the Gentiles, even against the Samaritans who were part Jew and part Gentile. He was, they, you know, like the Samaritan woman, the woman at the well. Well, she was half and half. Well, they were pretty prejudiced against them as well. Of course, she's the one that Jesus went and sat by the well and talked to. That's why his disciples thought, what are you doing? She even asked that. Me? You being a Jew are talking to me? Well, that was their mentality. Well, Paul went to these places and, and he preached this gospel that there was a new covenant that God has given and it was not the old covenant for the Jews, but this is now for the whole world. And anybody can put their faith in the Lord Jesus as the son of God and be saved. And it was happening all over. Well, as soon as he would go and then he would go to the next city and he would stay there and teach them some. But basically, they were pretty much ignorant to the ways of God. And immediately, you know, people would come in, especially the Jews would try to put them back under Judaism and pervert the gospel that Paul had just given. So he, he always had trouble with that. But now these people in Colossae, they were, they really thought, they heard about Christ, but because they themselves were worshiping the gods, which they called them, which were the fallen principalities ruling over that area, you see, caused them, it was really a form of Satan worship, you see. Well, then Satan, as soon as Paul would come and preach the gospel and people would be saved, then these other people would come, which they call wolves in sheep clothing. They seemed like they were right and they were not. They were come, sent by Satan really to deceive the people and take them off of the truth. Well, these people, most of these people, some of these people were true Christians and they're the ones that wrote Paul and said, there's something really going on in, in our church and it's a community. And, um, and some people have come in unawares and they're bringing this false doctrine that Christ was not the son of God, that he was just a, a, a man. Now people are saying that today. They'll, They'll be saying it. They'll be trying to tell all the Christians, Jesus was just a man. Actually, he had an affair with Mary Magdalene. I've heard about all that. Oh, yeah, he's got a bloodline. And I hope, you know, even Trump might be a part of the Jesus bloodline. That is all a lie. Every bit of that is a lie. And it's against the gospel. Every bit of it. <laughs> no, Jesus did not multiply himself that way. He did not. He died in order for us to be his body and really his children to bring God a family. But it's not going to be the natural way, the, the way that we do it. Not No, not that way. It's going to be the way of the cross, the way for him to die and be ascended on our behalf to bring us into heavenly truths, not bring Jesus into some kind of earthly method to have children. That's that's the Da Vinci Code. I don't know if you've all seen that movie or not, but that's what that's about with Tom Hanks. Well, we know about him too, don't we? Well, and all that is a big lie. And there's so many people that believe it. Oh, good. Maybe I have Jesus's bloodline. Well, the only way for us to have Jesus's bloodline is for us to be born again, put our faith in his blood, and then and and then he therefore creates in us a new creation and we're new created beings maybe with divine blood within the new man within us and i don't know that i don't know that but we're but in the resurrection we will have divine blood i do know that and we still have physical blood because we still have a natural body but we have to remember when we're born again, we have a whole new, uh, the Bible calls it the inner man. That's the spirit in us is renewed every day. The outer man, this is, 
man or woman, is perishing. But the inner man is renewed day by day. That's why we come together. That's why we hear these truths. That's why we're edified in hearing that. We also understand some of the deceptions, and I think we're going to really talk about a whole lot of them along the way, because they're all coming. They're going to come big time. And we have to know these are the lies of the devil big time. And men, because the body of Christ has barely been taught any of these truths about Christ being in us, hardly knows that. Most of the people that go to the big church just two miles from my house, this is a mega, mega church, huge. Okay, a lot of the young people, I've been in all my life, I was in, I was in church and I was in church school and now I was in, and he's, they said, we, they didn't even know they were saved. So nobody even taught them how to have the assurance of their salvation. And I'm thinking, good grief, what in the world are they teaching? So I'm just saying people are weak, really, and not grounded in the truth of the gospel because they've hardly heard it. They've hardly heard the gospel. And that is the power of how we stand in Christ is the fact that the cross is the centerfold. The cross is not just the death of Christ. That's just the beginning. The, the cross means the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the ascension. It means the total uh, death, burial, resurrection, ascension of Christ. That's the meaning of the cross. The cross brought about that resurrection and ascension. And he did it on our behalf, therefore making us new creations. So actually, the, when we're born again, we are a new race of being, you all. We're, you know, we still have our human blood and human genealogy. But that's not our true identity. We have a new identity. We, have a, we are a new creation. And actually, the Bible says we're born again of an incorruptible seed. Well, I mean, we know that the seed of your father and, and joined to your mother produced you. Well, that's a corruptible seed because we're going to, we, the body will die. But in Christ, even the body is going to be redeemed. You see, redemption means we're bought back and we'll never die. It says we're never, we never perish. We will, li we live forever. Why? Because we've got the life in us, the resurrected life of Christ within us. That's really what Easter is about. Easter is not about just, you know, learning about his resurrection and learning the history of it all. That's really great to know. But the truth is, what does that mean to me? It means that his resurrected life is within me, raises me from the dead, brings light in me so that I can truly understand God's ways. And I can truly understand what the Bible means. I can truly have a Lord that really communes with me, talks with me, walks with me, knows me, and I can know him. And I can hear his voice within me. I can hear him speak to me. I know the way. You see, and so, so, so the next time that what Paul is bringing up in the next few verses, and I'm going to read verse 15 through 19, he has to deal with this uh, lie that had been taught there in Colossae that Jesus was not really the Son of God. He was one of, he was a son of one of the gods, like which are the principalities of fallen angels is who they are. And so they, they took the preeminence away from Christ as being the son of God and just made him like one of the fallen angels. So Paul has to set them all straight. And this is what he says in verse 15. Now he's talking about Christ who delivered us and has and has brought us redemption through his blood and then it says 15 who it means christ is the image of the invisible god now he is the outer image of god the father 
the God the Father is invisible. He is not, we will never see an old man with a long beard in heaven being the Father. The, the Father is spirit. He, he does have his vis, he finds his visible form in his son, Jesus. Jesus is the physical form of the Father, you see. Now, we're the physical form of the Son, Jesus. We're just like Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. He's the first man that was that was a created being that was reborn is what that means. He was. Now, okay, he's incarnate. He was incarnate in Mary, you know, because uh, she had the divine seed, the incorruptible seed of God inside of her that brought about Jesus, you know, that because Jesus' father was a heavenly father. It wasn't Joseph. We know that. People are saying, oh, no, it was, it was, you know, just like they're trying to say Jesus had a wife, Mary Magdalene. I'm telling you, that's a huge lie. I mean, it sounds reasonable. It sounds like, well, that's really good. I'm sure that happened to him, and they think they can prove it and all that. And, you know, Jesus has no natural bloodline. It actually, um, when, you know, there was a man... Um, Ryan Wyatt that discovered the Ark of the Covenant. I don't know if you all have ever seen that on the internet, but that's very interesting because, you know, the search for the Ark of the Covenant. Well, in the Old Testament, the Ark of the Covenant was had a mercy seat, was the top of the Ark of the Covenant. And the priest would have to come and sprinkle the blood of animals on that on that seat so that it wouldn't be a judgment seat because the judgment was against us unless we had we were atoned for and and the way to atone which was make us atone means at one minute at one minute is what atonement means at one minute that that makes us one with god in the old testament was the animal sacrifice that that represented what the New Testament became, which was the blood of Jesus, was to be offered on the mercy seat, the heavenly mercy seat. Well, Brian Wyatt, you can look it up and you can see that he really discovered uh, the Ark of the Covenant. And on it, there was, there was a black substance, which he scraped off and had it analyzed and guess what it had the mother chromosome but there were no father chromosome because because his father was god and so there's no way you can be a full person if you only and so he was different he was not born with a a, a sin nature like we were he was not born he was different because when we were born, we all were born with a sin nature. He was never born with a sin nature. But was it possible for him to sin? Oh, yes, it was. Therefore, the Bible says he was without sin. That's why he could be the perfect sacrifice. If he had had one sin on him, he could have never atoned for our blood, for, our, for us. He could never make the atonement for us. The atonement is at one minute, making us one with God again. And it needed the blood of his, of the, of the son of God in order. And when that was analyzed, they had to say this hat, he had to have been Jesus. And what they realized that was right below uh, the place where he was crucified. And when he was, when he was crucified and when he died and his blood was poured out, the earth cracked open and it fell and 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 they could see that the ark of the covenant the old ark of the covenant is hidden right there and his blood came and fell on that mercy seat atoning for man in on earth but 
the Bible tells us that he also had to offer his own blood on the heavenly uh, mercy seat because what Moses got and what he got to bring up forth the um, tabernacle and the temple. And someday I really need to tell you all about the tabernacle and the temple that, I mean, the tabernacle first that, that um, Moses, that God gave Moses the pattern to build. And the pattern was a heavenly pattern. And so when Jesus actually died, and Mary saw him and he said, don't touch me, is because he had to go to the Father to offer his blood on the heavenly tabernacle that, that was really there. So all of the tabernacle was really an earthly pattern of a heavenly reality. And so God, Jesus did it both ways. So his blood went through the earth and went down into the very place where the Ark of the Covenant was and for a, really an earthly atonement, but also a heavenly atonement. So in, in both ways, he did that. So, so if he was not the son of God, he could never do that. He could never, number one, be sinless. Because if he was not the son of God, he was born like all of us as sinners. He could never be the perfect sacrifice. Never. So he had to be, he his his father was God, the invisible one, and that's what this said. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that were in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, very important, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers all things were created by him and for him now let me just stop right there that does not mean that he created the fallen angels because they are powers and principalities and have dominions he did not god never created anything corruptible. Everything that has been corrupted is because we have fallen in, in disobedience into corruption. So he created these, all these dominions, all these angelic forces, all these angels, perfect. And a third of them through Satan decided that they they believe Satan. The third of the angels fell when Satan fell. Now, two thirds are not fallen. And, and that could be trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions, you see. But so when God, when Jesus created all things visible and invisible, God cannot create corruption. Corruption happens because we've fallen from our first estate, fallen from how we were created, how we were originally created. That's what transgression really means. Fallen from what, how you were originally created. Okay, so we see that originally he created all these things for him and by him and for him, you see. Okay. And he, Christ, he's, he, the writer here, which is Paul, is saying he is the creator of all things. I mean, you you all think that he's one of the gods. No, he is the second person of the Trinity. He himself is the true son of God. He's not one of the God's sons. You see how, how, how Satan has corrupted everything. We can hardly talk because half, half of the time, Satan has already misused everything that's right and corrupted it. So when you say these things, people, if you don't make it clear what you're saying, people will not understand it. Some people think, oh, he created all these fallen beings. No, he created nothing fallen. We have fallen out of our first creation into what God never intended to be. Although it did happen, so it did not pass God by because God 
even knows how to control even the fallen. God is still Lord over all. Nothing, nothing got him blindsided. The fall did not blindside God. When Satan fell and took a third of his angels, did not blindside God. And God Almighty is forever sovereign over all and Lord of all. Satan thinks he's Lord. He's a liar. That's all he can do is lie. And Jesus is preeminent above all. That's what this is saying. Let me finish. And he, Jesus, is before all things, even before all the principalities and powers and dominions that God made, all the angelic forces. They were not created first. He, he, he is Father. He, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have always been. They always have been. There is no beginning. There is no, except when he came into time. Jesus came into time. That's true. But he has, he's always been. He, he was not created in heaven. He, he, was, he is the son of the father. And by him, all things consist. That means every atom, every molecule, everything you look at is held together by what? Well, the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, by his word, he holds everything. By him, everything consists. So even the fallen dominion the fallen angels they have their existence in god it doesn't mean that they're right no they're fallen and wicked and they deceive the whole world and they're deceiving this world at this time they're also deceiving our world at, the, at our time okay because all things consist by him by his word and he is the head of the body that means us, the church. The church is not a building, never has been. It's not made of stone. The church is the multi-membered body of Christ. It's the, it's, the, it's the mystical body of the head who is Christ himself. And we are the body. We actually are the bodily form of him. Doesn't make us God. It doesn't make us the second person of the Trinity but we're pretty close because we're his body. So it's like we're next to kin to the Trinity. That's how we were created. In our fallen, fallen place, we've fallen way below, way below even the angels. We were created higher than the angels, but, but through the fall, we've fallen lower than the angels. Why? Because they still have immortal bodies, but we have mortal, mortal bodies, bodies that die. And we're still stuck in time and space. They're not. You see? So we fell lower than the angels. That's why the, in the book of Hebrews, it says that Jesus was made lower than the angels. Well, he was, he is the creator of all things. He is number one. Okay. Then he created all the angelic forces. Okay. But because man and man was created a little lower than God, original man, a little lower than God. Now, we, when we fell, we fell lower than the angels. So when Jesus came, he that created all the angels had to, had to be made lower than the angels because he had to be made man just like us. Why? So he could raise us up in his own resurrection to be one with him in spirit and raise, that's what the resurrection is really about that we are raised in Christ far above principality and power. We're raised and seated with him in heavenly places. That's why the Bible says, go boldly before the throne of God. Boldly. We don't have to crawl or bow and scrape like we're, no, we're, we're adopted into the beloved. I mean, we are loved far more than you can ever even love yourself. God loves you greater. And he knows greater of every one of us. And don't, we don't go around saying, oh, I love myself now. I don't have to say that because I don't have to, used to, I, I would hate myself all the time. But I don't go around saying, oh, how much I love me. You know why? Because I don't even think about me anymore. When I hated myself, I thought about me 24-7 and how I could be better and what I should do, what I should not do. What does God want me to do? Always about me. You see, I don't even think that way anymore. 
Now, all I can think about, I don't, I just don't have that kind of consciousness to think about me. I think of what God wants to say when I teach. What is the Lord? What is the Holy Spirit wants to want wants to say? Wants people to know. What you know? What? Where can I go next? How can I? How can I help more Christians? Because I think Christians have been so deceived, really. But anyway, he is the head of the body, the church, who is who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. That means he's the one that was first raised from the dead. And he was. We were raised in him, too. And in all things, he might have what? The preeminence. Preeminence means the superior one and so he paul is saying to these colossians how dare you believe that jesus christ was not god's son god's only son and you've been so deceived you think that he was one of the god's sons the fallen gods or the fallen angelic beings sons and you've misplaced him. He is preeminent of all. He created all the angels. He created all the principalities. He's, he's the creator of all things. He spoke them into being. He is the word that spoke everything into being. So he's setting them straight. He is the Lord. And I've even heard this. There was a woman that came from Washington State, came to our, this was about, oh, it could be like 20 years ago. So I know it's far worse now. But anyway, she came, she lived in Washington State. Now, David lived out there about 10 years ago or so. But anyway, thank God he's not. Thank God he's home. He's here. We like him to be home. But anyway. This woman was a Christian and she'd been in a lot of the Christian churches out there. And so when she came here, she said, Sylvia, you won't believe what people are saying in these Christian churches. And I said, what? They're saying Jesus wasn't really God. He was just a good man, just like we are. He's just like us. He wasn't really God. And I said, oh, my gosh, you don't please. She says, oh, no, they are saying that. And that was like 20 years ago. Who knows what they're saying now? You see? And so, and then it said this last verse, for it pleased the Father that in Christ should all fullness dwell. Well, that's why if Christianity is not rooted and, and grounded, and have its full foundational source in the Lord Jesus Christ as the second person of the Trinity, the, the son of the father, the creator of all things uh, that was incarnate in the, that little virgin, only about 14, 15 years old as all Mary was, a little virgin long before she was truly married to Joseph, you see? And he became man. He became, he was reduced to mankind. Why? Because God so loves us. God so loves man that he could not even bear to think of leaving man in such a lost condition. Blind people walking around thinking that they have truth and totally blind to the things of God. God loved us so much. He's the one. We didn't find him. He found us. Everybody here has been, is drawn here because God has sent you here. God found you. <laughs> he found me. I didn't, I, we always think we found the Lord. Well, he, he found me. He found you, really. And Jesus says, no man comes to the Father unless the father draw you. So, in you see, that's why you want to hear these things, basically because the father has drawn you and he loves you, that he would send his son, his only son, 
to come, to, to be born in human form, which is incarnation. That's what meant, that means, God in human form. Because God was never meant, his presence was never meant to be in some kind of stone temple or even in a tabernacle. It started there in the Old Testament because it was it was leading to, to where the presence of God would finally be. You see, in Adam, God, Adam had God's presence. He was a light being. He was not just called the light, but he actually glow. He was a light being, and he lost that glory. And so, how was God going to bring man back to his cre original created form? Because a lot of people look at us. Well, okay, we're the image of God. Well. No, we're a fallen image. My body is not the image of God, okay? This is a fallen image. I mean, the image of God wouldn't be dying daily. We, I wouldn't be getting older. Uh, uh, Lewis wouldn't have to have his tooth pulled. David wouldn't have had to go to the hospital, you see? No, this is, this is a fallen image. Now, it's precious to God, even fallen because he lives in us and he manifests his life through us. <laughs> and so because of it, he was incarnate in man and that he grew up just like we, you know, except like I said from the beginning, he never had the sin nature, not like we did, never did. He had divine nature, but he had, he still, was tempted in every way without sin, but he was totally tested and tempted in this world. Satan tried his best to pull him back, to cause him to sin. He did everything he could to cause Jesus to sin, and he did not. He stayed true to his father to the end, and therefore he became the living sacrifice, the pure blood of Christ that was shed for our sins that would redeem us. And when we trust him with all our hearts, he not only redeems us, he justifies us, he will give us his spirit, he will raise us up, he will even, uh, he will even glorify our bodies at the very end. Our bodies are fallen. When we're caught up with Jesus in, at, at the last trump, and our, even our natural bodies will be transformed and we will have the same resurrected, glorified body that Jesus had. And Jesus, he was not limited by time or space. We're still limited by time or space. He was not after his resurrection. Even in this world, he wasn't either. But we've got to come to that come to that reality ourselves i don't think that's gonna that's gonna be because you know we're we're moving from glory to glory and the time will come i can say that it's all possible for all of us we could have walked on water like jesus we could disappear like he did even in this body we could do that we can do everything he did in his natural body and we can do that too as Christians as spirit people, not as people that are just walking in our own understanding and 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 still yet babes in Christ. We're not going to be able to do any of that as babes in Christ. But as we mature in the spirit, absolutely. We we Jesus says, actually, anything that I did in my lifetime, you can do too. We can raise people from that. We can do all those things. But you know, have to know what you're doing because Satan can imitate all that too. He can raise people from the dead. He can, you know, imitate all that kind of healing and all that. You want for it truly to be of God, we have to mature into that. And God has to trust us with that, that kind of power because people get power. Power is intoxicating to people. They get intoxicated with it, a little power even you know, Christian power. It has to be mixed with God's wisdom. It has to be God's power 
manifested through his wisdom and not just through our own understanding or how we think it ought to do ought to work no it has to be done in wisdom i always say that power without wisdom can be very foolish and i think that's what's happened to a lot of even charismatic people they just get intoxicated with a little bit of spirit power and then they think they're somebody well jesus never did that jesus was was so humble he humbled himself and became obedient to the cross even the death of the cross and god raised him up and and at the end every knee will bow every tongue will confess that he's lord i don't care if you're in if people are in hell at the very end every knee will bow that means that does not mean everybody's going to be saved i mean of course the people in heaven we will kneel knee bow our knee every tongue will confess even the liars who are in hell will have to confess jesus is lord and that's that's the truth so god raised him up to be lord of lord and king of kings now he wants us to be the little lord and the little king he wants us to understand his ways he wants to understand he wants us to understand his authority we can operate that authority we can actually have his anointing all these things are ours but we have to be matured into it and when when we're ready god will reveal these things in every one of you all i believe that even even after i'm gone you're going to all of you will every one of you will have greater insight greater knowing than i could have even thought about i think it should be that every generation is going to be greater i believe it and that's what I always tell people when I pray for people, I say the anointing that God has given me, I really, I give to you by faith, but it's going to be a greater anointing than I ever had. I always believe that that's, that's the way it should be. Jesus said that Jesus says we're going to do greater works than he did. We'll talk about that another time because it's not what we think well we well then that means we're going to be if he raised about three people we could raise about 20. if he you know did that did all these miracles we're, we're going to do all the he he didn't say it that way he said you're already automatically going to be doing everything i do but even greater things well now you can be thinking about that when i come back next week we'll talk about it what could be the greater things? And David, if you already know, don't tell them. <laughs> so okay. Okay. <laughs> let everybody think about it. What could be the greater, if it's not, no, the, let me just read you the verse, how he says it. Just listen to how he says it. it's in John chapter 14. In the book of John chapter 14, let me turn to it. Now, just listen to how he says it. And I want you all to ask the Lord, what could this mean? Verse 12, chapter 14. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believes on me, okay, that means a Christian, the works that I do shall he do also. It's almost a given is what he's saying and greater works than these than just raising people from the dead and you know healing people and all that greater works than these shall he do because i go to my father okay i'm just gonna leave you with that now i want you to think about what could be the greater works as i believe he's saying it's a given you're going to do greater works than these are a given you're going to do everything i've done here in my lifetime oh but something greater so the question is what could jesus not do and maybe you can ask yourself that and that might give you a hint okay i think we're finished for tonight dave okay has anybody got any questions or anything
No, but thank you. I learned a lot. I don't have any questions, but I'm already thinking about my answer. Oh, good, Stacy. That's nope. great. I think that was Debbie. That was Debbie. Oh, it, yeah. uh, oh, it was. I'm sorry, Debbie. I saw Spencer and Stacy's thing move, and I thought, <laughs> I know your voice. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. That's okay. Okay. All right. You think about it then, Debbie. I bet you already have it, but don't tell them. Okay. Well, thank you, Sylvia. Good night. Good night, honey. Good night. Anybody else? It was, it was a great lesson. I don't have any questions. You did a good job explaining everything, so I don't have any questions. But it was a great lesson. I enjoyed it. I got a page and a half of notes out of it. So. Oh, great. You know why that's important? Because you can read back you know, through the week and think about it and really look up some of the scriptures if I led you like some some place like i went to 14 13 for john 14 13 write those down and look at at some of those scriptures and read them for yourself and ask the lord what does this mean <laughs> you see that's what i started doing i started i wanted to know what these things what does that mean i don't understand that i don't i didn't start out thinking oh i understood everything i started out thinking i don't understand anything could you teach me lord and, and that's what i do uh if i don't understand something of course i ask you and then i go to the, I'll go to the lord about it but yes it, it was explained well tonight so i don't have any questions but thank you very much it was, it was a great lesson i appreciate it okay i love i love helping you all see the day will come when you all start teaching me Dave does. And now my son-in-law, Paul, is. My friend Jenny does. When that happens, then the Holy Spirit is teaching you and you've got to share what you've learned. And it might be something I hadn't thought of. Oh, gosh, I hadn't thought of that. See, that's why we're a body. That's why it's important is is not just, you know, I, I know you're the you're the teacher and you're teaching us, but it's always good to have other people's uh, reflections on it. And uh, right. Have your own different understanding and then you come together and get it right or whatever. But mm -hmm. Okay. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. All right. Good, Good night. night. Y'all have, great great night, great night. have a great evening. And, okay. Uh, thank you very much, Sylvia. All okay, right. Sylvia. God bless you all, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye.